Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate your attention and time. We've got a wonderful group here. My name is James Byrne. I'm a professor from University of Lethbridge. Uh, I'm not going to say too much more about me or my fellow convener, conveners, but I want them all to wave. Gabrielle Dreyfus is right here. She'll be up here working with me. Uh, Chris Rapley is sitting right here. Helen, Amanda, Helen, are you here right here? Helen, Amanda Fricker, is she here? There, she, is, that, is that her? She's coming in the door. Why don't we all give her a big round of applause? I'll say when she comes in, we'll surprise her. There. Oh, yeah. Give a wave. Um, Roland Krobel right here is with us as well, is helping us with this. There he is over there. And Ed Maybeck has been helping us as well with the, to pull this session together. Uh, and I think I'm just going to share a few things about what we want to do here. We don't want you to go eat at 6 o'clock. We would like you to stay here with us. We want to run a little workshop. We want to pick your brains. We want to interact. We want to go round table. We want to get together in groups. So we're really looking for ways to start new action, new partnerships, new actions, new partnerships to reduce climate disruption. We think this is critical that we do this as soon as possible. And so please stay with us. Uh, we're going to try to involve you as much in the conversation as we possibly can. These are some of the questions we'll give you to think about and talk about afterwards in your groups. Uh, you know, uh, so what, what do we do? You know, what can funders do? What can universities, research societies, what can researchers do? What can industry do? What can government, what can NGOs, what can AGU, AAAS? Um, you know, what, what can so many of our own agencies do? What do we gotta do something different. We're not, you know, we're not making the progress we should be making. So we'll be looking, and what others? You know, might you suggest, we're really looking for you to provide us with information. Um, so that's our session. Is environmental science serving or failing society strategies for rapid progress on climate solutions? And we've had a very generous offer and we've accepted it. We've got a commitment from environmental research letters to put out a special focus edition on this, this session. We would like to include you in that. Those of you who may be interested in being involved in authorships, in co-authorships, in partnership teams, in, in teams that pull things together, pull papers together for that, we would love to talk to you and we would love for you to contact the conveners and talk about that. So that's exciting to have gotten that really strong commitment from uh, Dan Kamen, the Editor-in-Chief of, of Environmental Research Letters and his staff. They believe in what we're doing, so we really want to have your help and attention uh, with, with that. And having said that, that's lots from me, and I'm going to try to say as little as possible hereafter. I'll be having my other colleagues come up at various times during the program. Again, thank you so much. And now, normally this is a time when someone with the kind of achievements that this colleague, wonderful senior colleague of ours who's been leading us all for so long, uh, I should be reading a 15-minute bio, a bio that would make her parents proud and all of us proud of her. But you know what? Everybody knows Jane Lubchenco, and that's really all I have to say. A wonderful person, a wonderful scientist, a wonderful colleague. She's going to start off our program. Jane, please come on up. Thank you, Jim. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I echo Jim's thanks to the organizers of this session. Uh, in addition to Jim, Chris, Helen, Gabby, Roland, Ed, I think that's the team. Thank you all so very, very much. Um, I'm really thrilled to have an opportunity to share some thoughts with you, uh, do some reflection on where we are and where we need to go. Um, I'm sort of perhaps being a bit melodramatic, but really challenging us to focus on this as a moment of truth. And think about um, our responsibilities, our obligations as scientists, uh, our responsibilities to um, society, to each other, to future generations. And I'm gonna do that by posing four general questions. <clears throat> what is the social contract for science? That's sort of the um, foundation of this session, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Why is it important? How are we doing? Are we fulfilling it? And if not, why not? And where do we need to go? So that's sort of the arc of my remarks. I'm going to start with the first two as a coupled uh, set of questions because they're intimately interlinked. 
22 years ago now, <clears throat> when I was president of AAAS, I had the opportunity to give uh, the presidential address that the president does each year. And I chose to focus mine on this title. This was the title of my talk. And then I published uh, a paper that came from that talk the next year in the journal Science. And the, my remarks then were very much focused on what I perceived to be a very serious problem that we weren't, as a community, facing up to. And that was that we had emerging environmental problems that we were not addressing to the extent that we needed to. We didn't have the science, the, we didn't have all the science we needed. The science that we had was not being connected to policymakers, to managers, to decision makers, to industry, to citizens. And therefore, it really wasn't being utilized. <clears throat> and so I simply um, posed the question, what are our obligations as scientists. In exchange for public funding, I believe that we have an obligation to be helpful to society. Now, everybody would say, duh, okay, that's fine. But what does that actually mean? And to me, uh, it means that the responsibilities are, go beyond doing really cool science and publishing it to share it with other scientists. To me, that obligation means doing science and sharing it widely, but also working on issues that in times of serious need uh, deserve a particular attention. At the time that I was uh, working on that, I was also part of a team that published this paper in Science Magazine. It was the cover issue for uh, this June or July, whatever it was, uh, July issue of Science, that before we were talking about the Anthropocene, science decided that there was sufficient scientific knowledge that humans were dominating the planet, that it deserved a special issue of science. Now, 20 years, 22 years later, this seems like so bizarre, right? I mean, they would never publish this because it seems like a no-brainer. But at the time, this was newsworthy. This was something that needed to have attention drawn to it. Humans, their activities were actually causing a lot of things to change. And those things are interacted and they have real consequences for people. So the fact that we live on a human-dominated planet was news at the time. And this is just kind of to ground this, especially for the younger folks in the audience, or to remind those of you who are my generation that this was sort of a, a new thing. So in the article, we focused on climate change, loss of biodiversity, depletion and disruption of ocean ecosystems, disruption of biogeochemical cycles focused specifically on nitrogen, because at that time we had doubled the amount of nitrogen that was fixed on an annual basis, uh, water, land transformation, all of those, and we quantified those to the extent that we could. What fraction of the change is due to human activity? So there was an element of attribution in this which was also new. So this Fatusik et al. article got a fair amount of attention and interest, and it also was part of this larger uh, challenge that I was thinking about and wrestling with, what are we as a scientific community doing to help share information about this human-dominated planet and be part of the solutions, not just part of the problem? So um, to make a long story short, uh, I concluded that we really were not delivering on our social contract, that uh, much of what the scientific enterprise was doing was creating vast amounts of knowledge, all sorts of cool things, but it wasn't collectively adding up to uh, the kind of information that society could use to be convinced that there were problems or that it could use to uh, solve solutions. So I suggested that the social contract that we needed was, had a number of elements, one of which was to focus on the really, really big, wicked, urgent problems that are out there. Two, 
to go beyond discovery and to share knowledge widely, and three, to do so in ways that were in some ways atypical of the stereotype that people had of scientists, to do so in ways that really were uh, humble and transparent uh, and with um, a fair amount of, uh, you know, just being very honest about what we knew, what we didn't know. Um, this was all focused very squarely on helping society move toward a more sustainable biosphere. And a biosphere that was not just ecologically sustainable, but was politically feasible, so that means having politicians buy in, that was just, so elements of equity, uh, that was economically feasible. And so that was uh, sort of reflecting my background as an ecologist, thinking about what sustainability was all about. I ended the talk that I gave at AAAS uh, with this cartoon from Bill Watterson. Calvin and Hobbes was still a thing at the time, and this is one of my favorite cartoons, so I'm going to read it to you in case you can't read it from the back. Um, Calvin is uh, in his little red wagon uh, being pushed by Hobbes. He says, it's true, Hobbes. Ignorance is bliss. Once you, start know, once you know things, you start seeing problems everywhere. And once you see problems, you feel like you ought to try to fix them. And fixing problems always seems to require personal change. And change means doing things that aren't fun. I say fooey to that. But if you're willfully stupid, you don't know any better, so you can keep doing whatever you like. Sort of going down a hill, getting faster and faster, Calvin says the secret to happiness is short-term, stupid self-interest. Calvin sees, I mean, Nahab sees what's going on. He says, we're heading for that cliff. Calvin, covering his eyes, I don't want to know about it. They go over the cliff. Crash. Hobbes says, I'm not sure I can stand so much bliss. And Calvin says, careful, we don't want to learn anything from this. <laughs> so I just thought that really encapsulated, you know, a lot of what we even see today about heads in the sand kind of thing. Uh, and it's, it's, it's not just, uh, it wasn't aimed so much at scientists, but just sort of at this attitude that, uh, we're better off not knowing what's coming. Let's just uh, do what we're doing. So I want to segue from that to, so that's the social contract, the original sort of idea in a very uh, condensed form. Why is it important? What do we want to do about it? Are we fulfilling it? Are we making progress? Did that call to scientists have any resonance with others? What have people done since then? Uh, not that this was the only call, mind you. Uh, it just was one that was published and, and uh, public. Um, <clears throat> and then, if not, what is needed? So I'm going to share my reflections on how are we doing today based on what I have seen in the 22 years now since then. And that's seen through the lens of a scientist doing research but it's also seen through the lens of my time spent in Washington, D.C., four years as the Under Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere uh, on President Obama's science team, uh, engaging with citizens, with members of Congress, with uh, industry, with NGOs, civil society, all around the country, uh, fishermen uh, here in Oregon on the right, fishermen in Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, lower right flying through Hurricane Sandy, uh, and uh, lower left dropping drop zones into the Gulf of Mexico to characterize the loop current. Uh, also as Secretary of Commerce engaging with governors, doing probably the first and only ever lab demo to members of Congress about ocean acidification instead of just talking about it. I actually showed them what it was all about. And you know, bubbling water that changes color, everybody gets you know, really interested in that. And because it wasn't a written testimony, they didn't know what was gonna come. And so they had to pay attention instead of just yakking and talking and you know, being on their, yeah, exactly. 
So uh, also uh, spent a lot of time with international uh, scientists, with uh, leaders in a variety of different spheres, uh, engaging in um, sharing science, <clears throat> understanding what people need from science. And then after I left NOAA, I spent two years as the first U.S. science envoy for the ocean, doing science diplomacy uh, around the world, uh, focusing on these five countries. So rolling up all those experiences and seeing how science is used, perceived, and portrayed help it sort of part of how I think about these issues. So to me, one of the most important and least appreciated roles of science is to help inform our understanding and our thinking and our decisions. Now, inform means informing individuals as well as institutions. And I use inform judiciously. I don't mean dictate. Science doesn't dictate any particular outcomes. And a lot of scientists, I think, don't get this. Policymakers, for example, are going to take into account a lot of things when they make decisions. They're going to think about politics, economics, values, um, all sorts of things. My point is science should be at the table as well. Science should be informing their decisions, not dictating them, and then the role of science in improving the human condition. So I want to tell you a couple of stories about my experiences with science informing policymakers, just to bring home the message that we aren't doing as good a job as we might think we are, and we're not doing the job that we need to be doing. About a year after I was sworn in, which as you see in the picture here, uh, we were in the middle of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. The fishermen in the Gulf were freaking out because uh, the oil was still gushing. They were concerned about what it meant to their lives, their livelihoods. Uh, the president asked the vice president if he would please go to the Gulf and meet with fishermen and talk to them about what the federal government was doing and what we knew. The VP said, happy to do that. Uh, I need somebody who actually knows more about what impacts oil is having on fisheries and uh, the Gulf and what we're doing. So the VP's people called my people and said, will Jane go to the Gulf with the VP? We said, sure. So I flew on Air Force Two with Vice President Biden to the Gulf and was briefing him on the plane. And I talked to him about uh, how oil affects different types of species differently, uh, how it affects vertebrates different from invertebrates different, or I didn't use those terms, how it affects fish differently <laughs> from uh, shrimp differently from oysters, and why those were different, and what we were doing to close fisheries where there was oil or we expected oil to be present, how we were testing seafood to make sure it was not contaminated before it was, um, we could use it. Partway through this, he stopped me and he said, I thought you were a scientist. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, what is he talking about? And he said, I just understood everything you told me. And I thought, wow, what a condemnation that was. How many times has he been briefed by scientists? This is a distinguished politician, a really smart person. He's been briefed thousands of times, and his impression of us is that he can't understand us. That's a problem. This is not a denier of science. This is somebody who will embrace scientific knowledge, but he thinks he can't understand us. So we have a problem. Story number two, uh, <clears throat> part of NOAA's responsibilities entails uh, building with, uh, in partnership with NASA, building satellites, flying satellites to get important environmental information. Many of you benefit from the kinds of data that come from these satellites. These were some that we were working on at the time. I, little did I know when I went there that we had inherited uh, a very dysfunctional satellite construction program and we had to fix it uh, and it was not easy to do. We did and then I had to go up to the hill to get the money to continue building these programs. So uh, I was up on the hill talking to some key members of Congress and described to them 
that how important these satellites were, that over 95% of the data that go into weather forecasts come from these satellites, and it was really important. The ones that were up there were doing fine. We needed to build the next generation so that we wouldn't have gaps in our coverage, blah, blah, blah. And this gentleman says to me, Doctor, I don't need your weather satellites. I've got the weather channel. <laughs> okay, so there are things that we just assume people know, and we sometimes talk to where we think they are, not where they are. So uh, Houston, we've got a problem, uh, and these, this is just sort of helping us uh, touch base with some of the challenges that we have, okay? It's not just getting people to understand the importance of climate change. There are some more fundamental things. So for science to inform understanding and action, I believe it has to be accessible, understandable, relevant, credible, salient, and useful. And most of the time, all too often, it is not. So that's part of our challenge. It's made even more complicated by this post-truth world that has emerged, especially in the 2016 elections, not just in the US, but around the world. And that makes some of these challenges even more uh, problematic. Um, <clears throat> the response of scientists to this emergence of, this, of uh, both the election of Mr. Trump, but also the populist uh, rhetoric <clears throat> that was taking on a life of its own was to become, uh, to, to really defend science. There were marches, there was defense. Many more scientists became actively engaged, writing letters to the editor, uh, being willing to talk to journalists where they hadn't before, a whole series of other things. Many of you have been involved uh, intimately in that. Um, I think that it's not just defense we need, but also offense. And part of uh, this uh, offense is directly relevant to what it is we're talking about now. So the lens through which I'm sharing these thoughts about are we succeeding in fulfilling the social contract, and if not, uh, where do we need to go? Uh, are through that lens of those political experiences. So first of all, where are we succeeding? I would suggest to you that despite a lot of what we say to each other about how really challenging and bad and serious things are, and they are, we actually need to take a lot of pride in the changes that have happened the last 20 years. Things are remarkably different in terms of the attitudes and the appetites of scientists for doing things that they didn't do before. And I just want to lay out a few of those. I'm going to talk about four advances. The first one is that a lot of scientists today are not just doing science. They are actively communicating it. They are active on Twitter. They are speaking to the media. They're writing blogs. They are actively communicating science. SciComm is a thing now. It didn't used to be. When I first uh, co-founded the Leopold Leadership Program and Compass and Climate Central, we were concerned that people would not even apply to those programs. And, and folks are doing this stuff. It's happening. There are a lot of training programs that are available, a lot more through the years. So there has become, there have become many more opportunities and more and more really superb scientists are actively involved in doing this. I don't ever want to suggest that all scientists need to be publicly communicating. Some don't want to, some aren't good at it, some shouldn't do it, but they should all support their colleagues that do. They should all support their students that do. And there has been this antipathy in the academic community to not letting younger students or junior faculty get engaged. They need to keep their heads down and do what they need to do. That is outdated. That's not serving us well. I talk about becoming bilingual, and that's how I think about science communication. We need to teach students the language of science and we need to teach them the language of lay people, and they need to be able to do that communication. And that is part of 
what we as a community need our colleagues to be doing. We've learned a huge amount from social scientists about science communication. This is the science of science communication. What works, what doesn't work. There's a wealth of information. Um, Ed and many of you have been right in the thick of this and it's really exciting. There are a lot more discussion about this. There are a lot more how-tos. There are models that are out there. So there has been huge movement on this front and that is exciting, it's positive and we should congratulate those who are actively doing this. Advance number two, we have moved from just doing basic fundamental science to doing what Donald Stokes calls use-inspired science. Um, Donald Stokes's uh, Pasteur's Quadrant says that the classical dichotomy of applied versus basic science doesn't really characterize the science that we do today because there's a third category that he calls use-inspired science. That is fundamental, it's pushing the boundaries of fundamental knowledge, but doing so in a way, or challenge, tackling problems that are immediately relevant to society. And I think this is the kind of science that many of you do that is hugely interesting and exciting. And I'm not suggesting that there's any problem with basic science or applied science. It's just we have more diverse options available to us and use-inspired science is where a lot of the action is today. Again, it's not applied science, which is often taken to mean taking existing knowledge and applying it to a new situation. This is moving the boundaries of knowledge ahead. It is fundamental advances, but instead of being just pure curiosity driven, it's driven by an interest in solving a problem, in understanding something that is directly, immediately, scientifically relevant. Third advance, we've moved now from just communication, which I was talking about and focused on in my uh, 98 um, social contract paper. I was focused on sharing knowledge. We've actually moved beyond that, and I would update that now to say simply sharing knowledge is a good start, but it's not enough. We need to be engaging with society. We need to be co-creating knowledge. We need to be working with people, listening, not just talking, learning from them, uh, working together in partnership, and there's been a lot of movement in that front. And the fourth advance that I would cite <clears throat> is that we've moved from just diagnosing problems to helping create solutions. And scientists, especially environmental scientists, have a public reputation of just being chicken littles uh, and saying doom and gloom and stuff is bad, nobody wants to hear it. But this is saying, actually, we do have bad things, but let's work together on the solutions. So co-creating solutions and focus on solutions is something that people had often shied away from but are doing more and more today. There are a huge number of solutions that have been created in the last 20 years. Uh, they aren't at the scale that are needed, but we've got lots of models that are out there, things that can be emulated. So I think scientists have actually uh, whether they were inspired by the social contract idea or not doesn't matter. Scientists today are responding to societal needs. They are moving from the ivory tower to embracing a social contract, whether they call it that or not, and moving from that to just uh, to be science being embedded in, engaged more with, and serving society. And I think we're seeing that in a very activist way play out in real time, and it's tremendously exciting and interesting. So I would say to you that more and more environmental scientists are actively sharing their science more broadly. They're conducting use-inspired science. They're engaging with society. They're crafting solutions, and they're doing all of that better. There are a lot more of us, and we're doing it better. We're learning from each other. There are communities of practice that are out there. These individual scientists are fulfilling their social contracts, I would suggest. However, their efforts have not been commensurate with the need. So the question is why? Where are we failing? 
And I would say <clears throat> that part of the answer is that they have been individual efforts. They've been working despite the system because they believed in it, they were passionate, they thought something else was needed and were driven to do it. So we've had a lot of individual action, it's been very exciting, but it's not what we need because it's not enough to overcome these serious impediments that exist in society, in science, and in academia. And I'm gonna focus only on the latter. Uh, I think the serious impediments that exist in academia are first and foremost, the culture of academia. It doesn't reward engagement with society. It doesn't reward communication. It doesn't reward creating solutions. It rewards classical number of grants, number of publications, quality of the journals, total amount of money, and more recently, it didn't used to, but more recently, the quality of your teaching. So we've seen one evolution in the academic world where now teaching is more routinely part of the determination, more so from some, in some universities than others, for sure. But the reason I raise that is that we have been able to change the academic culture. And so by extension, I'm suggesting we need to continue to change the culture and have it also embrace uh, scientists getting out of the ivory towers, not just doing research and teaching, but more of these larger societally relevant issues. And the reward systems and the incentives need to reflect that. That's part of what would be in the expectations. Uh, a job description should include the expectation of doing outreach and communication. Uh, promotion and tenure decisions, et cetera, should also, it has to be incorporated into the reward system. We need to be training our students, uh, our young people. Uh, we need to be giving them resources to be doing these things. And we need to have, be more open in uh, partnering with uh, others, whether it is uh, the private sector or civil society, uh, to create ways to connect to society through them. Uh, we don't do that very well. Uh, universities are not very open to that. So I would suggest that we've made huge progress. Individual action has enabled significant progress, but without collective action, we're not gonna deliver what society needs. So it's really the collective action that I think we need to focus on. What does that mean? How do we do it? To me, it means confronting these cultural barriers, creating an opportunity for dialogue about engagement as a core responsibility for at least some faculty, everybody supporting it, some of us doing it. Two, changing the incentives in job descriptions, promotion and tenure criteria, recognition and awards are all a key part of that incentive system. It doesn't reward the kind of stuff that society needs. Three, we need to be providing that training and mentoring, uh, not only about communication and engagement, but also things like conflict resolution, negotiation, systems thinking, teamwork, the kinds of things that are really required to do active engagement. Four, enable partnerships. <clears throat> For example, um, a university might, uh, a, a group of faculty <coughs> might want to partner with the local community or with a local NGO. So you need to have the legal and the financial abilities to have, to recognize uh, and partner in meaningful ways uh, around problem solving, where you can bring different perspectives, different actors to the table, and that is really complicated. It's more complicated than it needs to be. We can fix that. Five uh, out of six is to create communities of practice. So we're sharing best practices and knowledge about this. Uh, and finally, we need funding for a lot of these things. There's nowhere near enough funding to do all the training that is needed. And I'm not just talking about your PIOs at universities doing the communications training because teaching scientists to be bilingual is very, very different from teaching them what to wear to an interview. Uh, it's just a totally different kind of mentality and skill set. So a strong offense, which is what I suggested, 
that we need means serving society better, and that means engaging more, co-creating knowledge, providing hope, not in uh, a Pollyanna sense that is you know, false, but I actually see so many amazing things that are happening. Even though they're not at the scale they need to be, they are wonderful models for what could be. We have models that show things are possible. We need to escalate. We need to scale those up. We also need to focus more on solutions and remove these cultural barriers uh, and focus on training. So to bring this to a conclusion, um, I really think this is a moment of truth. We are focused very much on the climate emergency. It is incredibly um, challenging. It's uh, serious. We don't really appreciate the full extent of how serious it is. Uh, and, but it's not just climate. It's also loss of biodiversity. It's disruption and depletion of ocean ecosystems. There are multiple things that are interconnected, and it's not just climate. Climate is the more obvious one to many of us. But this moment of truth is timely. And I focused on what our obligations are as scientists through my personal lens, why it's important, uh, how we are actually doing some pretty amazing things, but it's not all that we need. And I think that it is time for a renewed social contract for science. I think it's time for us collectively to make a quantum leap in our engagement with society. It's time for strategic, collective action, and it's time to change the culture of academia and to mobilize enabling conditions for science to serve society more effectively. These are the things that I've touched on. It's a broader portfolio of things than just those. Uh, but that's where I am, and the question is, will you help make that happen? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jane. That was wonderful. You're going to get a chance to engage more with her. Um, Ram Ramanathan is one of my favorite people. He's one of many of your favorite people. He's one of the convener's favorite people. He's one of Pope Francis's favorite people. Ram is at home uh, dealing with a serious illness. He may be watching us. Could you please, could we wish Ram well with a round of applause? Uh, he can't be here. As you can see, Chris Rapley has joined Jane on stage, and they are going to have about a 15-minute conversation. Uh, and I'm going to see if they may very well engage you as well. I'm going to leave it up to the two of them. Um, and uh, I'm going to start them off on that timing right away here. So i am turn it over to you, Chris and Jane. Thanks very much, Jim. And thank you very much, Jane, for a, for a terrific talk. I'm, I'm Chris Rapley. I'm a, a pro professor of climate science at University College London but previously ran the Science Museum in London. And prior to that, I was director of British Antarctic Survey. And it was in 1998 in that role uh, that I first came across um, Jane's wonderful paper, Entering the Century of the Environment, New Social Contract for Social Science, uh, a New Social Contract for Science, which she uh, has just been uh, building on. Uh, and I have to say that paper had an enormous impact, uh, certainly in the UK. Sir John Krebs, who was the head of the uh, National Environment Research Council, insisted that all of the senior scientists read it. There was a lot of discussion about it. It inspired a lot of us uh, to ask the question, well, what are we for uh, and what should we be doing and are we doing it or not? We felt that we weren't. And uh, what we've seen is that individual scientists, either inspired by that or coming to their own conclusions, have done a lot in the last 20 years. But in some respects, um, much is the same. I mean, your, your talk just now was really very similar to the messages that you were delivering here. And, and so uh, at, you, you particularly asked uh, in that paper for the following, new research management approaches, new training in interdisciplinary skills and savvy to work across the science society uh, divide, uh, rethink the way science is deployed, and you implored the AAAS to act. Now, we, we, we can have a voice here to influence uh, the AGU. And so, um, whereas individual scientists have responded, 
what do you think the barriers have been to the large institutions? Because up until now, we haven't seen them shift in the way that we might have hoped. What do you think is the problem there? Thanks, Chris. Um, I do think we've seen some action. We've seen um, professional scientific societies being willing to make public statements, for example, about climate change. I think that's very positive. That has actually, uh, I think, been important. Um, we have not seen them change uh, as much as I believe is needed. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that's a huge opportunity. Um, organizations like professional scientific societies respond to their members. And if they don't, then kick the bums out. Elect new people who will. Uh, <clears throat> but I think that there is an appetite now to be responsive and an interest in doing things that actually are helpful. So the challenge is to identify what is it that could be done that would make a difference. Um, <clears throat> so some ideas might be understanding that AGU and other professional scientific societies are not focused only on academic science, okay? So I've been talking a lot about academic science because that's my world. But in that, in that world, there are things that uh, need to be done. For example, um, a lot of people say, we can't really evaluate the caliber of scientific communication or engagement. We don't have metrics for that, okay? So setting aside the snide comment that we actually don't have very good metrics for evaluating quality of science either, which you know, many of you will understand. Uh, but there is a need to give some serious thought to that. What, what might be reasonable things for a PNT committee, for example, to think about when um, evaluating uh, an individual's, uh, not just how much time they spend doing something, but the quality of it. Because part of what promotion and tenure decisions are all about is um, rewarding quality, not just quantity. So that's just one specific example. Um, I think that it's worth having professional scientific societies ask, what could they do to provide more compelling information to state legislatures, to governors, to members of Congress, above and beyond, here's a paper, read it, and do what we say you need to do. So different ways of engaging with them that would understand what their needs are and be responsive to their needs. So there's some opportunities there. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. Universities are actually quite diverse in terms of how responsive they have been to these cultural challenges. There are some deans who have been doing very progressive, very creative things, having students focus on problem solving, on use-inspired science, providing opportunities for training uh, and engagement. Those need to be highlighted and rewarded and uh, used as examples. There are great things that are happening. Uh, so Lisa Gromlich's in the audience here. What she has done at University of Washington uh, is a nice example of this. Uh, Kim Cobb is one of our speakers later uh, in this session. She and her colleagues uh, have been doing some pretty amazing things uh, in terms of engaging with um, the local managers around sea level rise issues. So you know there, there are a lot of good things that are happening. The Bren School at UC Santa Barbara has been doing some very creative, use-inspired, problem-solving, training students from around the world to really deliver the kinds of answers that society needs, coupling or partnering with the private sector, partnering with funders, partnering with governments, and doing so in a way that is part of a learning experience of students. So there are a lot of good things that are happening that need to be amplified and made public and shared. Uh, but there's a lot more out there, I'm sure, that I, I don't know. So simply taking stock of all the great things that are happening, sharing best practices, could be really useful. 
Um, those are just some immediate ideas, Chris, but I okay. think there, there will be a lot more forthcoming in this the, the, uh, session. The, it turns out that there's quite an opportunity because uh, quite by chance I heard uh, a presentation a couple of hours ago over in Moscone North from Susan Stickley from AGU. Uh, AGU is going through uh, uh, developing its new strategy and it was fascinating to see that a lot of these ideas are being incorporated. So I think we're on a bit of a roll. So uh, the one thing that she uh, emphasized was that the AGU is not a separate entity, it's all of us. And so the uh, encouragement is for all of us, essentially, to, to uh, make our voices heard and encourage them in this direction. Um, the, the, it's, it's one of the problems that, uh, you, you know, I've been very much involved with the International Council of Science and some of their programs, trying to break down uh, interdisciplinary uh, barriers. You know, reductionism is the only way that you can really advance science, but on the other hand, you pay the price that you develop lots and lots of little silos. And um, one of the things that I've noticed is that natural scientists find it uh, hard enough, you know, for a physicist to talk to a chemist and a biologist, you know, that's a, a problem on its own. But I see that the, the social sciences, the science and technology studies, the neuroscientists, the people who understand people's values and how people make sense of the world, there's a huge body of science out there which would be helpful. And yet it's very hard to stitch that into the busy day of a natural scientist. Have you got any ideas on how we might get better at doing that? Um, so I would challenge one thing you said, Chris. You implied that we really haven't made a lot of progress in doing interdisciplinary science. I think it's been huge. Yeah. I think people are routinely collaborating, especially within biogeophysical sciences, but more and more between biophysical and socioeconomic sciences. And <clears throat> we've learned a lot about what works and what doesn't work, and there is a huge amount of that underway. So I would sort of chalk that up as an area where we have made more progress. It's not enough. Mm. Uh, but the other thing that you said I think is really important. Um, when I was growing up in science, uh, you know, everybody talked about biologists having uh, being envious of chemists, chemists being envious of physicists, physicists being envious of mathematicians. Uh, and it was this very reductionist approach to the world. And I think what we have seen is the emergence of uh, the counterpart to that, which is understanding uh, complexity, understanding um, the, the importance of holistic approaches uh, where you need to think about these coupled systems that we have as complex adaptive systems. They're not just complex, they're complex adaptive systems. And there's been a lot of really exciting work done understanding what it is about complex adaptive systems that enable them to persist through time. We haven't folded that knowledge into thinking about any of these social uh, problems and environmental problems that we're talking about. So I think there are huge opportunities to learn from the progress that we've made, but apply it more directly to thinking about how do we change incentives for actors in, uh, around an environmental issue in ways that convert um, a vicious cycle into a virtuous cycle uh, where we're trying to get away from behavior that creates more and more problems and we want to create behavior that actually has good outcomes for everyone. And so thinking about and in understanding how complex adaptive systems are relevant to a lot of the problems at a variety of spatial and temporal scales um, I think is a hugely exciting arena that we haven't really tapped. And how that re relates to what AGU might do, I don't know, uh, but it's worth thinking about. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand me, I, I ran IGBP, I know we've made enormous progress yep. in uh, interdisciplinary science, but as you say, there are still some big gulfs to be bridged. I don't know if I should say this, but years ago when I was a young scientist, a, a very crusty old um, 
professor once told me that you could judge the IQ of an oceanographer by the depth of water they studied. So we, we've kind of moved on. <laughs> we've kind of moved on a little bit, hopefully, since then. He did retire a long time ago. Um, which kind of brings me to, to young scientists, because certainly our experience in the UK is that when you start talking about this stuff with early career scientists and immediate postdocs, they kind of go, oh, yeah, we get this. Of course we need to understand this. Um, so that's where we can, but it'll take a long time before they filter through the system. So have you got any um, thoughts or ideas on how we could uh, take advantage of that natural enthusiasm that we find in young scientists who don't necessarily know whether they're still going to be in academia in four or five years' time, so they like to see that their work is actually being beneficial to society? Yeah, young scientists are one of the things that really give me hope because there is so much uh, passion and curiosity and willingness to um, just jump in uh, with both feet. And uh, what I think is lacking is giving them, you know, giving them the tools and the wherewithal to be successful, but not getting in their way in the, in the traditional ways that we have. You know, not saying don't engage, don't communicate, um, letting them, um, you know, finding the right balance. Uh, uh, again, you know, we, we can't just sort of say, okay, go do it. Uh, <clears throat> although in many cases, getting out of their way is sometimes the best thing we can do. Uh, but I, I think that they, uh, they are really going to be the problem solvers, the creators. What we need to do is create the right environment for them to thrive. And it's not the traditional kind of environment that we had when we were uh, growing up, if you will. Okay, we, we, should, we should probably call this to a halt. My, my neuroscience colleague tells me that the thing to do in a situation like this um, is to have people leave the hall with one big thing in their mind that they're committed to do. So it's a bit of an unfair question to drop on you at, uh, at a moment's notice. But what would be your message to everybody in the hall? What is the one big thing that they should carry from this and uh, maybe commit to uh, addressing? So I'm not sure it's one big thing, but what comes to mind is the importance of incentives. Incentives for young people, incentives for faculty, incentives for deans or provosts, incentives for the president of AGU, incentives for our elected representatives, incentives for fishermen, incentives for members of Congress. So much of what we do is driven by incentives. And if we can figure out what the perverse incentives are and how to remove those and how we can change the incentive system to reward the kind of behaviors that are going to bring collective good as well as individual good, then I think we'll be in a better place. Thank you very much indeed, Jane. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris and Jane. Uh, I'm going to invite the other four panelists to come up. And I'm going to invite my colleague, Gabriel Dreyfus, to come and take over the microphone. So uh, you guys get to recline in the audience for a few minutes. <laughs> and, uh, and Gabby's going to come up and take over the microphone. And the other four panelists, please join us on stage. Um, with no further ado after that, that thought-provoking discussion, I would like to uh, introduce our four speakers. Uh, we have Jonathan Foley, who is the executive director at Project Drawdown, which produced the New York Times bestselling book, Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. We also have uh, Gwendolyn Blue who comes to us from the University of Calgary, where she is an associate professor of geography and conducts research in the internet connected areas of public controversies involving science and technology, 
public engagement with science and uh, cultural and, and ethical dimensions of that. And then we have Sarah Meyer, right here, <laughs> who is a public scholar, scientist, advocate, and communicator from the University of Washington. And to my left, third from left, we have Kim Cobb, who's from the, University, the Georgia Institute of Technology, where she leads a paleoclimate and climate change research lab, and as Jane was just telling us, is leading an engagement with the community. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jonathan. Um, do we want to pass a mic down? Or are you going to speak? Or do you, are you, yeah. or, or do you, or do you want to come? Do you want to do professor? Whatever you want. Come on to the podium. Oh, okay. Podium. You know, um, I actually had a whole bunch of slides, and just about three minutes ago, I decided to not use them. <laughs> so um, this is kind of going without a net. Uh, and I'm, I'm just really inspired here today because of uh, two things. Uh, one is a community I get to work with. Uh, first of all, I'm here representing actually Catherine Wilkinson, who was invited to be on this panel, who's far better than I am. Uh, she's actually in Atlanta, and I just happen to live here in San Francisco, so I've subbed in for her. Uh, due to some time crunch, so um, I'm very happy to represent her, but you would have been far better off if she had been here. Um, but second, also some colleagues who are connected to the organization I work with who are also on the panel, which is very inspiring. Uh, Sarah Myrie and Kim Cobb, who uh, are uh, colleagues of, in Project Drawdown. It's a large network of people we work with, so that's very inspiring, and I just want to acknowledge that. This is obviously the work of many people uh, is what we're going to be talking about today, not any one person at a podium, of course. Uh, but I also want to uh, single out Jane uh, for just some acknowledgement and a lot of um, heartfelt acknowledgement and thank you because uh, her paper and her presence uh, has affected the course of my career and my life for sure. And I'm sure that's uh, true for thousands of other people. But I was a young academic when that paper came out. I was going up for tenure at the University of Wisconsin. I was one of, uh, got to go to the Aldo Leopold Leadership Program that Jane also pioneered. And her kind of message of a social compact for science really struck a nerve with me uh, because that's why I went into this field in the first place. Uh, I was inspired by you know, the use of science to do good in the world. That you know, we've, We're the inheritors of so much beauty and so much work from so many generations before us. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the first generation in human history to deliberately and knowingly leave behind a degraded world for the future. And we don't want to do that. So let's, as scientists and as human beings, more importantly, stand up and see what can we do to help build a better future for those that come after us. After all, we benefited from all the generations who did that for us. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, maybe one example of the kind of vision that Jane set for all of us and maybe just some learning uh, on the journey we've had at this thing called Project Drawdown. Full disclosure, I wasn't part of Project Drawdown when it first got started, so I'll tell you a little bit about it, partly from what I've learned from people that were there before, but also the journey we've been on since. Um, Project Drawdown is focused on one thing, just one. A big one, though, is what are the most viable solutions to climate change? That's it. It's a perfect example of the pastor's quadrant of use-inspired research. It wasn't taking 100 academics who were kind of doing their own thing and saying, let's figure out how to speak to the issue of climate solutions. It started with a blank slate and said, no, this is our sole and only purpose is to do research on this one really important question. Strangely, this did not come out of a university. It didn't come out of the IPCC for that matter. It actually came out of mainly a group of non-scientists and writers and entrepreneurs and environmental advocates who just said, gosh, I'm listening to all these scientists, but no one of them can seem to answer the bloody question. Do we have enough solutions to solve climate change or don't we? And if so, which ones are the ones we should do and how do we do it? So believe it or not, the scientific community had failed in some ways to really answer that question in a way that was compelling, clear, and grounded in data. Uh, of course, we have thousands of efforts on the periphery of this, and we have all sorts of things that piece this together, but not a single place where you could go find that. So that was kind of the genius of Drawdown kind of 1.0 before I joined this organization that I thought was really great. It said, let's focus on a big question, start with a blank slate, and answer a question that frankly should have been answered decades before, but hadn't been in a very clear way. So that was job number one. Job number two was to articulate it in a way that could be heard and could be seen by others uh, in a broad, broad way. So the result of that is this, uh, this book that came out, as mentioned. It was a New York Times bestseller. It still is, actually. It's selling better now than it did two years ago. 
Uh, it's about 15 languages. It's doing pretty well as a book. Well, being a best-selling climate book isn't all that hard, it turns out. Um, you know, <laughs> sorry. But, you know, Michelle Obama and, uh, you know, Stephen King are not worried about us at all, believe me. Uh, you sell 12 copies. You're the best-selling book on climate change, probably. Uh, but anyway, it's the thing that was remarkable about what they did before, and again, I had nothing to do with this, is they did this great research looking at about 100 different climate solutions, doing the very first true apple-to-apple-to-apple -apple 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 comparison across all these different sectors, whether it's electricity or food and land use and agriculture or industry, transportation, buildings, all the major emission sectors, as well as sinks on land, ocean, and engineered sinks and so on. Nobody had really looked at that in a comprehensive way using the same methodology, the same units, the same methods of analysis, never really been done. We were comparing apples to oranges, to kiwis, to grapefruits, but finally we could compare the different apples together. So that was a good accomplishment. <laughs> But the second thing that wouldn't have happened at a university, probably, maybe, maybe it would now, but it wouldn't have happened years ago, is instead of writing a bunch of journal articles, they wrote a coffee table book. This actually reached millions of people, way more than all the articles I've ever written combined would ever reach, uh, for example. So I think that was kind of another stroke of genius. It might not have happened, but for this you know, kind of new social compact of science, do work that matters and engage society. So I want to talk about that journey uh, that Jane has inspired, I think, the whole community to think about is how do we really address problems and provide solutions as scientists and what we're learning along the way in our little organization, but also how we can better engage society. And third, how do we keep that North Star of a true social compact to guide the science that we do? So first, the evolution of the kind of work that's done at a place like Project Drawdown, we first started with the what in terms of figuring out about solutions. That's a natural thing to do. We as scientists like to quantify things, we like to measure things, we like to put numbers on things. So Project Drawdown's kind of first analysis of climate solutions did the big what thing. We ranked about 100 different climate solutions. We asked how big are they in terms of gigatons of CO2 equivalent prevented to going into the atmosphere. We asked how much would they cost in terms of dollars and then how much would they save in terms of dollars. Bottom line, it turns out we actually do have the solutions we need to address climate change in the world right now, enough to prevent or remove between 1,000 or 1,400 gigatons of CO2 between now and 2050, depending how you want to do it. And you probably spend about $25 trillion and you probably make about $75 trillion along the way, not even counting the damages you prevented because of accelerating climate change. So that's pretty good, that's great. Turns out what isn't enough? Because we know the what. We know there are solutions. They're just not actually getting scaled, to Jane's earlier point. So now we have to move from the what to the how and the who and the when. So that's what we're doing in Drawdown 2.0. We're revising all the solutions with more rigorous research, more up-to-date things to be released in February, in fact, as a big public kind of release as an electronic book and a whole bunch of materials. But we're going beyond the what. We're updating all that. But now we're also moving to like what levels of agency who actually does these solutions? Is it policy making? Or is it the flows of capital? Is it changing the rules of business? Is it behavior and cultural change? Because they're all playing a role in solving climate change. It's not just DC. It's not just policy making. It's not just business. It's not just investment. It's all of the above, everywhere and anywhere, all the time. The other thing we have to think about is the uh, how which is, you know, what are the accelerators of solutions? What are the things that will get them out into the world most quickly? The other thing we have to look at is also the when, because some climate change solutions right now, for example, the deployment of renewable energy, the deployment of energy storage in the form of batteries is cheaper than anybody ever predicted today. And we don't need policy making for that anymore. We just need the market to go do that stuff. What we need now is for policymaking and better rules and investment to work on the harder decarbonization sectors. Electricity is easy now. What we need to worry about today is things like steel, concrete, cement, and those kind of things, fluorinated gases, but also in the ag and land sector. How do we prevent deforestation, which is now on the rise once again? How do we fix the food system and things like food waste? How do we shift diets towards a more plant-rich diet? All of these are becoming the primary questions. So we're starting to lay out what can we do today with market forces in the 2020s while policymaking, R&D, and investment shifts the landscape so in the 2030s we can deploy the next generation of climate solutions and in the 2040s we mop up with what's left over. So we have to come up with an actual plan which is sequenced just like you would a company, just as you would do a stage gate venture here in Silicon Valley. 
That's the evolution of this. But also the evolution of communication, as Jane alluded to as well. I really loved her comments. It's half the reason I threw up my talk. Was that, um, how could I follow that, right? You know? So, um, but the evolution of SciComm, which I never liked the term outreach or SciComm. It implies a one-way conversation where we scientists impart our wisdom to the world. Nonsense. I've learned, and I think we all have, much more by listening than we have by speaking. My mom used to say, you know, we have two ears and one mouth. Try to use them in that ratio, okay? <laughs> so uh, I try, struggle, don't always succeed. But it turns out that I think in Drawdown, we did a good job of broadcasting what we knew, but now we're listening and we're finding that there are so many great ideas from community organizations, from businesses, investors, and philanthropists, and we're trying to listen very hard and turn how to serve that larger world, creating new kind of organizations explicitly from day one to serve that larger public need. Uh, universities still struggle with this outside of extension parts of university where people have to wake up in the morning and their job is to engage with broader society. And as Jane pointed out, that needs to be incentivized or rewarded and far too often in academia it's not. And we need to change that. Uh, finally, let's keep that North Star of you know, the social compact of science. I alluded to the version I keep in my heart, which is uh, now as a father, soon to be grandfather, yikes, um, is the intergenerational compact. I think a lot about my ancestors and I think a lot about my descendants. Maybe it's just personal, maybe you share that. Maybe we have an obligation to each other who live in this present moment that we could live a little bit better too. But I'll just close with one quote by uh, Barbara Kingsolver, who's this wonderful American writer. She wrote once, here's what I've decided. The very least you can do in your life is figure out what you hope for. What I want is so simple, I almost can't say it. Elementary kindness, enough to eat, enough to go around, and the possibility that one day kids might grow up to be neither the destroyers nor the destroyed. That's all. So with that, thank you, and thanks to Jane. Uh, let's give her another big round of applause for inspiring all of us today. <laughs> Jonathan, very impressive for having just thrown away your slides. Very, very <laughs> impressive. Um, so with that, I'd like to call up Gwendolyn Belugio. You can either have to stay where you are or take the mic as you like. You're bringing up the slides. Um, open the slides over here. Are you seeing them there, Gwen? Yeah, I see a blue there, but it says on Mac. So while we went through technical issues, Jonathan, you mentioned uh, you're in a listening mode now with Project Drawdown. How, yes. Yeah, totally. All right, so we're actually getting a little switch. Um, Sarah Meyer, please. I'll save my question. <laughs> Good. Hi everyone, good afternoon. I have no slides, so don't look up there. <laughs> um, and I have a, a script too, so. Um, good afternoon, uh, I wanna begin by acknowledging the conveners of the sessions. Thank you to doctors Fricker, Byrne, Rapley, Dreyfus, and Maybach. I also wanna acknowledge and thank the other speakers today, including doctors Lubchenko, Ramathan, Ramathanan, Folly, and uh, Blue and Cobb. I specifically want to thank Dr. Lubchenko for her leadership as the Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and, and as the ninth Administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It is an honor to serve on this stage with you, Dr. Lubchenko. My name is Dr. Sarah Myrie. I'm here today speaking in my capacity as the Founder and Executive Director of Rowan Institute which is a think tank and nonprofit organization for leadership in a hot and dangerous world. We uphold feminist, anti-racist, anti-colonial norms and practices to train scientists, students, and STEM practitioners in public scholarship and climate leadership. I want to thank and acknowledge the board members of Rowan Institute, including Barbara Klabitz, Priya Shukla, Tyler Valentine, Sara Ticola, Gabby serrano Marx, Dr. Juniper Simonis, and Erpi Ruiz Angeles. My talk today is entitled, 
Mediocre careerism, respectability politics, and bad behavior by senior scientists erode global climate leadership. Wow, what a fun and catchy title. Just another confrontational step down the path of indicting allies in public, you might think. Why is a, what's a, such a negative frame when what we really need right now is brave and hopeful leadership, you might think? Why can't you focus on something more positive? Some climate solutions, you might think. Such a nasty woman, you might think. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. As we all know in the canons of science communication norms, to properly communicate, we must start by being personable and then follow by telling a story. So because motherhood is such a highly valued social and moral good within the patriarchy, I will tell you in a very relatable and warm way that today I am here with my six-year-old son. We've had a really great time seeing old friends, exploring the exhibit floor, and spending time at the NASA booth. What an absolute joy. We are both learning so much. Now I will tell you a story. Of course, the best stories about women are really just vehicles to explore their relationships to men. Indeed, reality itself does not pass the Bechdel test. Some of you may know that my partner in Seattle is a man, a chef and restaurateur. He is extremely talented and very successful. Like with most entrepreneurial relationships, I, as the partner, play a role in supporting the success and see the business from the backroom perspective. Being in the business has allowed me a certain perch to surveil the restaurant landscape in Seattle of business owners, power brokers, and storytellers. Recently, there was a review of a new restaurant opening in Seattle, a neighborhood joint with classics, steak, Brussels sprouts, French fries. The spread in the magazine is buttery light and gleaming white tile and timeless presentation. It is glowing. In the article itself, the chef is asked, why has he been so successful? He answers, I give people what they want. I don't follow fads. What a straight shooter, that guy. He really calls him like he sees him. But let me paint a more complete picture for you in this small microcosm of power, careerism, and respectability. This magazine's story and the money and attention which will flow from it is not a product of his talent, but of his power. That article was placed because he had the cash to leverage a publicist for his business. That publicist, publicist pitched and placed the editorial spread, designed to be an infotisement to promote his restaurant opening. A journalist uncritically copied word for word the glowing, the story this chef is telling about himself as a man of the people, failing to mention his MBA or his growing multi-business empire. That line about fads failing to mention that real cuisine fads in Seattle come from the innovation and creativity of black chefs, Southeast Asian chefs, Ethiopian chefs, Korean chefs, and more broadly immigrant owned businesses. Chefs like Eduardo Jordan of Solari and June Baby, Mutsukoma Soma of Ko Komonegi, Melissa Miranda, of Musang and Makiki Howell of Plum Bistro. This is what white male power does. It transacts with impunity for its own centrality and storytelling perch in the culture, uses that perch to narrate counterfactual ideations of self-importance and conscript, conscripts toadies and footmen to do the dirty work with the false promise of future power in exchange for loyalty. Then it uses harassment, surveillance, threats, and direct violence to maintain power, centrality, and impunity. If you need evidence of this final point and struggle to believe women, I suggest you read Ronan Farrell's book, Catch and Kill. Culture works this way, with the veins and axes of power undergirding our ideation and storytelling of the world. These axes shunt resources, time, attention, health, safety, and life itself away from some people, some places, and towards other people, other places. Culture works this way across scales, too. A part of Seattle's innovative Im immigrant-owned restaurant culture is dampened and shunt shunted, not nurtured because of the stories these white men tell about themselves. At a different scale, the institutions of United States democracy have been foundationally damaged by the normalization of nepotistic white male power in the form of extortion, lies, intimidation, bribery, and totary, and transaction of power often done through the media, storytelling, and litigation. For such a system, President Trump is a logical conclusion. And at an even larger scale, effective action on climate change has been impeded for 30 years because of the political assassination and anti-democratic campaigns, a form of extortion, lies, imitation, imitation, bribery, and totary waged by ExxonMobil, Shell, British Petroleum, and other fossil fuel companies. Campaigns fueled by the wealth generation and power of international corporations, which are the most powerful economic entities that have ever existed in the history of our planet. 
Their transactions are so damaging and genocidal, they are foreclosing the future of the totality of life itself on this finite and living world. Systems of harm nested together, some people benefiting, some people hurt. Here we find the genocidal systems of white supremacy, fascism, nationalism, colonialism, neoliberalism, and capitalism. Here we find the billionaires, the oligarchs, the warmongers, the predators, and the enablers. The veins and axes of power that maintain white patriarchy are the same axes of power that fossil fuel companies operate from. Now, you might be saying to yourself, hey, I'm not a billionaire oligarch. I'm not a white supremacist. I'm a geologist. <laughs> and to that I would say, I understand that, Steve. I get it. <laughs> but let us put aside for a moment the reactions that center on the self and the moral behavior of the individual and think of our community collectively. We together dream a dream, a detailed and well-referenced dream about how complex and interconnected and imperiled this living planet is. We together tell the stories about the sensitivity, reactivity, and commitment of the climate system, about acidification, deoxygenation, sea level rise, sea ice collapse. We tell the stories through documentation and evidence and hypothesis testing of how the world is wounded and how that wounding happens from individual to ecosystem to planetary scales. We, our community, we are containers and brokers of this information in public. Many of us might feel like midwives sometimes, helping person by person through the birth canal of this information. Sometimes we might numb and compartmentalize away from this information, the burden being too heavy. I feel, and I know many of you feel, the pressing urgency and crisis on a daily basis. We as a community struggle with right action and public narratives, balancing and fighting between personal action and structural change arguments. We are hurting too. Researching and understanding the world is often, but not always, a process of learning more clearly how the world is being hurt, the explicit physical, chemical, or biological mechanisms underway, who or what is responsible for the, that hurt, and how the wounding will accrue in the future if unabated. That's it. Climate and earth science itself is an explicitly political act of surfacing the very nature of how power, wealth, and violence are transacted across the surface of this finite planet. It's like we cannot properly ideate our positionality as scientists, knowledge brokers, in a world of planetary scale foreclosure and harm. Is it just too great of an ask? It seems that we are either too big or too small, too hot or too cold, never just right. Some in our field consider themselves the tip of the spear, the front line on the battle for truth, self-deputized as culture hero, not conceiving of the role of toxic masculinity in narrating their centrality. Some in our field narrate this moment as a business opportunity, simply a new venture for venture capital, new field for venture capitalists to colonize and profiteer before eventually moving the human population into the vacuum of space or to Mars. Some narrate climate solutions in the counterfactual vein of white saviorhood or of solutionaries giving solutions to the people of the global south as if indigenous people would ever need to be told about the rights they have to their own lands. Others demand the public debate be arbitrated alone by scientific authority rather than by justice-seeking indigenous, intersectional, intersectional, or labor communities, not conceiving of how this positionality is a power over and not power with framework. Some in our field are silent, believing the lie that engagement here is a form of identity politics and culture wars, a red flag of bias, rather than an integrative and ethical response to existential and systemic threat. And for those of us in the justice-seeking communities, we are tethered to and defined by opposition to these norms. Rather than ideating and power building on our own terms, we circle the bottom of the drain of the culture, litigating and re-litigating our humanity and the humanity of others, using the same norms of leadership, for, not for justice, but for just us. We are here at such a precipice of a moment, well aware of the deadlines we are pressed up against and the hundreds of millions to billions of lives at stake. If this information is powerful enough to drive vast reorganization across all of civil society, then we must act like it. If this information presses upon the power and profit of the richest oligarchs and billionaires and warmongers in the world, then you can be damn sure that, whatever, that what is necessary for scientific leadership right now is an interrogation of the norms of power itself. This is the precipice that should drive us straight towards a structural surfacing of systems of harm to bring our curiosity, our scholarship, our privilege to this work, to reveal that what is asked of us now is a reconstruction of the norms of power sharing itself. Whose world is this anyways? Whose future are we fighting for? 
So much of the scientific community demands that this is our world and future to arbitrate and control at our will, and that progress at any cost is what we must fight for. In this frame, racist, misogynistic, and colonial be colonialist behavior are just unfortunate externalities of having to move fast and break things. And if we do not have the capacity to do, as if we do not have the capacity to do more than one thing at once, as if this worldview of normalizing and accepting some harm as inevitable is not at the foundation of this crisis. So here we stand, having misstepped or perhaps worse yet, refused to move at all. How do we ethically move forward? How do we learn the lessons of the past while still moving forward at the necessary speed? We need to look to organizations and leadership that have made radical change before. I'm talking about organizations that saw, that saw the plight of any given person is worth correcting in the name of everyone. We must dethrone scientific leadership as the ultimate arbiter of authority and instead act in solidarity and alignment with justice, civil, and labor leaders who have the embodied knowledge of movement and coalition building. We must organize and act in solidarity with the leadership of the civil rights and labor rights move movement at the individual, institutional, and national level. We must not excuse ourselves, our peers, our institutions from transacting in or looking away from systemic harm in all its forms. And we must not let scientific leadership norms at the highest level of power calcify into reductive, supremacist ideations of individual power. There are no sacred cows here, and certainly everyone in this room is replaceable. We are leading the culture, and we need to act like it. Indeed, some of the community view this structural lens on leadership and power to be a fad itself, a manifestation of the new climate wars. And those who advocate for a pluralistic and informed lens on power and privilege are character assassinated as compromised or overly emotional windbags. Our mor mor moral purity is indicted as a sign that these ideas are not robust. And this is an old political trope. But indeed, I am not a perfect vessel for this information. Indeed, from a practice of embodied power sharing, regardless of my indictments and my thesis here, a more fundamental cho choice of power sharing would have been to cede this speaking time to a black woman an indigenous woman or other woman of color. The fact that I, as a white woman, am on this stage, while many of them are struggling or barred from such events or no longer living, is itself white supremacy. My body in this place of attention and power is part of the problem. To close, let's revisit that fun talk title, Mediocre Careerism, Respectability Politics, and Bad Behavior by Senior Scientists Erode Global Climate Leadership. These characterizations of self-inflation, policing the gates of legitimacy and discourse, self-deputize as culture hero and arbiter, and actually engaging in direct harm and harassment. This is bad behavior. This behavior is hurting our ability to care for the world and her peoples. It is hurting our ability to lead. So cut it out. Do better. Stop excusing powerful white men and white women. Stop laying down for the egos of powerful people. Take back power from reductive supremacist leadership. Stop omitting the power and violence of fossil fuel companies from your ideation of climate solutions. Bring your scholarship, your curiosity to deconstruct the transactions of legitimacy in our community. You all are smart, resourceful people. Organize with one another. Start a union. Plan a protest. Outfit a lactation room. Stand in profound solidarity and interconnectedness. Share your power, platform, and resources. And do not settle for anything less on this path towards climate justice integration because a better world is possible and we are on our way. Thank you for your time and attention. I love you. hear that talk every day at AG, but we need more of it. <laughs> and, and in that time, we have uh, found Gwendolyn Liu's presentation, so please. Thank you, everyone. And those are some very, very hard acts to follow. I think that these talks are, are, are remarkable. And, and sometimes I think technology has a mind of its own, that it's um, going to lead to um, some better transitions. So I'm actually quite glad that my slides weren't um, showing so that we could hear that absolutely incredible talk. I think that that's a talk that everybody should hear over and over again. 
It, it, my, my talk follows uh, very um, smoothly from that. And what I want to do is to build on this idea of a social contract and to, to provide some context. I, I feel a lot like a fish out of water here at the AGU. Um, just to give a little bit of background, I, am, I come from the interpretive social sciences and humanities, and I want to bring in some insights from that, and particularly to take this very generous and robust and I think important heuristic of the social contract and to expand it just a little bit beyond the very important talk that we've had from Dr. Jane Lipchenko. Lech so thank you so much for your leadership in this. And what I want to add is just a, a, a small and a modest and humble intervention into the idea of the social contract. The social contract has a very long history, and it goes back to the European Enlightenment. And I think it becomes an important um, way of thinking, an important heuristic, because it really is about democracy. It's about power, as we've just heard from our, our previous speaker. And it gives us a, a framework for thinking about what we can do next. So I'll, that's pretty much the premise of my talk. But I want to start um, just with a, a tiny uh, trip down memory lane. So this is my second time at the AGU, and I was invited in 2009 to talk about public engagement with climate change. And it was just after, I had just flown in from uh, Copenhagen, and we were giving some of the results of a, a very big initiative. I think one of the largest scale public engagement initiative that has taken place, and this was organized by the Danish Board of Technology, and it was called Worldwide Views on Global Warming. And we were very fortunate to host the Canadian arm of this initiative in Calgary, Alberta. Now, for anyone who isn't aware, Calgary, Alberta is, is the, the hub of oil and gas uh, in Canada, and we have uh, our fair share of um, politicians and people who do not believe that climate change is happening. So we were quite thrilled to actually show that Calgary has other things to offer and that we can um, offer a, a space for people to provide some feedback into climate policy. So Worldwide Views on Global Warming had over 4,800 people from around the world on one day giving inputs into climate policy. And we took those results at, it, in Copenhagen to, to raise awareness of that. Now, one of the things I found very interesting about this, this particular talk that happened, and it was organized by Dr. Matt Nesbitt as well as Dr. Um, Matthew Boycott, uh, is it, th that we had some response. Most of it was, was positive, but there was a, a, a blog that came out. And I just want to call a little bit of attention to this blog um, because it wasn't that positive about, about our, our, our talk. And it, um, it, it said that the things that we had drawn attention to things such as representation, such as framing, such as democracy, really didn't fit within an AGU conference. It had nothing to do, we were told, at least in this blog, with science. I also want to call attention to, although, although um, I think that the, the, the blog itself was actually somewhat complimentary um, to me, uh, but, but I did find it uh, terribly offensive that I was called Ms. Blue as opposed to Dr. Blue. Um, <laughs> But what I want to do is I want to use this as an occasion perhaps to, to respond to the blog and to respond to the question because this particular individual left that presentation feeling very disappointed and, and didn't quite understand what it is that we were talking about or why he should care about issues of public engagement, representation, and framing. So I just want to take up that question um, and why should scientists care about these perspectives from the social sciences humanities about climate policy and climate engagement, but also about a social contract. And as we've heard, I think one of the, the major reasons to care is that equity and justice matter. And these are some, some things that, that the interpretive social sciences can give insights into. This is also something that's taking shape within the position statement on climate change that I see from the AGU. Um, and, that, uh, and I think this is really quite important, that done strategically, efficiently, and equitably, the needed transformations provide a pathway towards greater prosperity and well-being, while inaction can prove very costly for humans and other life on the planet. This is... Uh, a very um, uh, neutral statement, I think given a lot of flesh and blood and emotion by our previous speaker. But I think that it does matter that we take equity into account. Context also matters, and that's again something that the interpretive social sciences and humanities can offer. And, and notions of social con contracts and a changing social contract 
which science have been covered, um, and there's a great deal of discussion about this from terms such as post-normal science, the shift to mode one to mode two science. We also have discussions about a new social contract for climate change coming out of, out of geography in, in the UK, as well as notions of technologies of humility, some new types of values that perhaps that scientists can take on board in terms of addressing um, some of the needed changes in, in the interactions between science and society. I absolutely was beyond thrilled to be able to, 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 to hear um, Dr. Lubchenko's discussion about her work on the social contract. And I pull these up. If you haven't read them, you absolutely must. I have assigned these to almost all of my classes in science and society. And, and I want to take up just a couple of the, the notions. Um, again, just a reminder about, about some of the things that, that, that have been worked on that need to be worked on. That, that these are some quotes that I've taken out of the 2015 article. Scientists bear responsibility for these failures, again, to address society to varying degrees. And this need to be proactive in addressing the reasons why scientific information is often not available, understandable, usable, or credible. And, and this idea of scientists needing to be bilingual, I think, is really important. Um, to be able to speak the language of lay people, to translate complicated things into something that's understandable, and to do so in ways that's credible. And what I want to add to that to that very important discussion about participation in terms of what we've heard about the advances that have made and the work that still needs to be done is this very important concept of parity. And what I mean by parity is that parity is the foundation of justice. And so parity of participation must be the foundation of a social contract. So for those of you who like models, I suppose this model might help. Um, and then what I mean by parity of participation that, that it involves three three very important aspects. One is representation, and this is the political dimensions of science and science communication, is that to involve um, citizens in a meaningful way, this means um, moving from what's called non-participation, but also thinking about tokenism right into levels of citizen control. So this puts a different role for uh, lay citizens in, the, in, in discussions about, about science. There's also a cultural dimension, and that means recognizing different worldviews, different perspectives, and different ways of thinking about both knowledge and reality. And a very important discussion about redistribution, a redistribution not only of wealth and funds, but also a redistribution of, of power. So what this adds then to a discussion of a social contract is that knowledge in the surface of deliberation and choice, what we might call democracy, has a parity of esteem with knowledge in the service of action. And I take this quote from Noel Castor, who's also wrote, written about an expanded social contract. So in simpler terms, a parity of participation really is about, as Aretha, Aretha Franklin calls it, respect. It's respect for diverse ways of knowing. Diverse ways of knowing, not only in terms of worldviews, but also diverse ontologies. So we might think about pluralism, and not just about one world are possible, but many worlds are possible, many pathways, in order to, to transform um, our future. Respect for the partiality of all knowledge. And here, all knowledge, including scientific knowledge, has limitations. I know that's something that we all know, but actually putting that into practice when we're making solutions can be very, very difficult. And importantly, for efforts to redress inequalities in the production of knowledge. And this means directly addressing issues of sexism and racism in science, and to make those efforts for equality part of our, as, as important as our search for, for new discoveries and usable knowledge. So I'll end with just a, a very important quote from, from Noel Castry. To have choices, you need diversity. To register diversity, you need to recognize the partiality of your own framing of reality. To decide what to do practically, you need to relate and compare alternatives, harnessing research the varied understands of the actual, the possible, the probable, and the desirable. So my one takeaway, if you will, um, is that parity is very important to a social contract. And, ver and parity within participation is important, which means respecting and, and recognizing different ways of knowing, redressing existing inequalities, and recognize the limitations of scientific knowledge. Thank you very much for your time.
Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, with that, I'd like to call up to the microphone, Kit, Dr. Zinkov, um, Science for a Warming World. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Okay, I have four seconds left. Uh, <laughs> the end of the day, I know you want to get out of here. <laughs> However, um, thank you. Okay, well, it's a, it's a great honor to kind of wrap such an esteemed panel and to uh, follow on Dr. Jane Libchenko's comments about where we've been and where we are and a lot about where we need to go, where we must go, really. And so it's really echoing so many of, of her comments, but also I think I feel blending some threads through the previous panelists as well. Um, it really working from the perspective of somebody who has um, really is in the middle of an entirely crazy mid-career pivot into the great unknown climate solutions. <laughs> so here you, here you go. So these are just going to flash by some images from our collective consciousness to bring this into the room and bring our hearts into a higher level of awareness at the end of the day here about what we are up against. These photos really need no introduction amongst this community, of course. Um, you know, Florence, the wildfires, and this one hits particularly close to home for me. Uh, this is a dead coral reef in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, um, killed by nothing other than climate change during uh, the largest heat extreme that this particular site has seen in recorded history. And so what I also want to, to say is something that really I think Jane spoke to as an undercurrent in her comments, which is we're going to have to science with our hearts. And that is also something that we heard from our previous panelists. And this is going to be a little scary, and it's going to be very new, and it's going to be extremely challenging, because that is not how we have scienced thus far. So I really woke up from 2016 with a firm recognition that I had to do something extremely different with my life. And personally and professionally, I'm in the midst of this uh, you know, crazy, crazy pivot. I'm going to share some of what I've learned. And you'll hear many echoes of somebody who has been thinking about this a lot more deeply and systematically than myself, which means I may be on the right track and there may be something here. But this is what I'd like to recognize as the climate solutions paradox, that we know enough and we know nothing. So what do I mean by that? We know enough in that we have actionable information coming out of decades of climate research to point us in the direction of urgent mitigation and urgent adaptation along quite specific knobs that are within our reach. That is the gift of climate science and the decades of research that has gone on in this community, right? That, that is the we know enough part, and we know enough, right? More than enough, one might say, actually. But we know nothing. What do I mean by that? I mean, in the context of the previous comments, all, all the panelists actually echoed this as well. It's not enough to read the IPCC report. It's not enough to have a list of 100 solutions that are at our fingertips. In order to make the actionable changes that Dr. Libchenko was calling for, we're going to have to place those solution sets within these complex systems and hopefully find miracles and fast. That's what I mean by not enough. I'm going to give you a super concrete example from the Georgia coast now on sea level rise, which is echoing the project that uh, Dr. Libchenko is referencing. This is what we know. This is what the National Climate Assessment tells us. Now, there are limits to this knowledge, very profound ones in this particular case, but this is where we know enough. <laughs> We know enough to recognize the imminent threat to these communities. We know enough to say that we have been underinvesting in this translational work for decades, and we are behind the curve. And what we don't know is why my close colleague's house flooded on Thanksgiving Day last year. It was unpredicted. It was a total shock to them as they were having their dinners in that neighborhood. And all of a sudden, the ocean's crawling onto their lawns in Savannah, Georgia, right? This is what we don't know. We don't know how to really help communities understand what it means to have flooding outside a king tide, outside a hurricane in 2019, not 2050. This is the kind of stuff we don't know. This is where people's, people's daily lives are being threatened today in ways that we actually can't even begin to grasp 
from mega cities like Atlanta. And so this is the context where we lifted up a project called the Smart Sea Level Sensors. Um, it was this person's house that got flooded during Irma and Matthew on the coast of Georgia. He's a computer scientist. I was sitting next to him at a meeting saying, I gotta do something. I, I don't know, I just gotta do something. And he's like, well, my house flooded and I watched my air conditioner float down my lawn and uh, that was really problematic because it wasn't forecasted. I was not supposed to evacuate and I stayed and I faced three feet of flooding in my property and I couldn't leave then. And so that was like a thing, Kim. I'm like, oh my, oh my, oh my God, what? I said. And so um, he is my co-PI on this project, and now we have 30 different co-PIs across the institution, and we, most importantly, have core partners in communities, uh, governmental organizations. The city of Savannah is a day one partner. The Chatham County Emergency Management Agency is a day one partner. One might call it a day zero partner. We did not even think about proposing this project until we understood what we could do to serve them, not in 2050 problems, but in tomorrow problems, today problems, and what they were up against politically, culturally, financially, and logistically. And so we have four main goals for the projects. We're focused on real-time uh, data collection from sensors, I'll show you in a second. Um, we're making, uh, aspiring to make, well, we're making them, whether they're accurate or not, we're making hyper-local flood forecasts um, with an effort to get down to the 10-meter scale for this extremely complex patchwork of coastline that is under really complex dynamical threats from combinations of extreme rainfall, hurricanes, wind events, king tides, and of course, uh, regional complexities in the rates of sea level rise. This is a huge example of the compound threat that climate change brings. And then, of course, we're building decision support tools. While we do the first two pieces, the sensor data and the integrated modeling, this is a decision support framework for building capacity to tackle the 20, 30, 40, 50 problems in a way that they can understand uh, what they're going to need and what decisions can be impactful. And then last but very not the least, thinking about what we can do to raise education awareness along the coast to build capacity for this problem and get interest in getting engaged in this problem. Because right now, I can tell you along these coastal communities, climate change is a dirty word and sea level rise is a dirty word. Nobody wants to hear those terms. So you can have all the info packets in the world, you're not gonna get anywhere. This is the network that we've lifted up in 18 short months on an absolute shoestring, and I'll come back to that in a second. These are the low-cost sensors. They're $250 a piece, and we have um, built a backbone of Internet of Things technology to relay this data back to us, to lift it up to portals for uh, local citizens. It's publicly available, and as well as emergency planners and responders. And this is the you know, flow chart of, of how we got this project done, right? Kind of like ask, listen, 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 ask, listen, and then apologize, ask, listen, apologize when you mess it up. Because we, we don't know what we need to know to be effective in these complex systems. And we make so many missteps. And you have to ask forgiveness and, and you have to learn. And I feel like I'm a first year graduate student all over again with this project. This is for, very for real. And then you have to ask yourself, after all your early successes, you're ready to pat yourself on the back, go up for some big grants, who is not at the table? Who is not at the table at these community meetings? Who is not raising their hand for a sea level sensor on their deck, right? And these are the underserved communities of Savannah, the poor, low income, mar historically marginalized and black communities of Savannah that are not at the table. And when we went to go say, you know, we have these cool sensors, like, whoa, back up a couple decades, lady. We have some stuff to say first, <laughs> okay. So now, I'm way, way, way underwater, even as an oceanographer who scuba dives, and thinking about how we can bring in social scientists, right, who have expertise in, um, in racial justice, in environmental justice, um, and, and unfortunately that was not a day one consideration. That was, that was a, a learning point and a misstep, and we are really trying to fix that right now. So this is the framework that we went in for a massive NSF grant that we probably will never get, right, come to that. But this is a, a figure that illustrates what this is. This messy thing that I woke up one morning, I said, I have no idea what I'm doing, but there are like 50 people um, that are part of this project and it's growing at Georgia Tech and it's growing down on the coast. And it's huge. You know, how are we gonna get this done? 
Um, this is somebody said, Kim, this is transdisciplinary research. I'm like, I'm glad there's a word for it. Um, you know, because this, this really makes me feel a little better. Uh, at least you call it chaos something. But you know, you have a research team comprised of 25 different PIs from across the institution. Every single college is represented on our research team. Every single college. Then you have the community and governmental organizations, including uh, environmental justice NGOs, all the way up to the mayor of Savannah. And then you have the communities themselves, and the, the, in this case, the schools that we're working with in underserved communities. And this is transdisciplinary work, and it's extremely messy, and it's how we're going to get this job done, and there's no funding for it. And I wanted to lift up Jeremy Hoffman's work um, at the uh, Science Museum of Virginia. It's operating a very similar framework. They focus on urban heat islands. I don't have time to talk about it, but Google it. Uh, he has a much better word for his a phrase for his project. It's called uh, throwing shade in the RVA. I mean, honestly, this guy, you know, millennials are just going to kill us. So just coming to the close for some challenges and opportunities, um, that funding piece is absolutely lacking right now. And we need to hold our institutions to account. I really love the start and the flow through of this panel about recognizing that we are part of institutions. We actually are institutions. We make them up, each one of us, in different ways. And so we need to hold them to account. We need to hold the NSF to account and federal agencies to account. Oh, and C grants go a long way. This is like on a shoestring. And you'd be amazed how much I've heard with this project. I just want to do something that makes a difference, Kim. I don't want to do what I've done for 30 years. I'm willing to give you a lot of leeway to see what we can do here. And private funding needs to be a part of this, right? And so I'm coming to a close, I know. OK, and thinking about this transdisciplinary, this transdisciplinary piece takes time and effort and investments. So how are we going to rethink deliverables beyond publications and grants to think about how we can nurture this along and encourage people along the way with deliverables that may look like a color, color for coffee table book, right? Um, not necessarily a scholarly work. And then think about the institutional piece as well. Um, we need to, again, reward public engagement across all ranks of science, not just across the young people who we can provide with training. We need to model what that looks like. We need to take out our hearts and be brave and bold and chart new territories and, and celebrate the diversity of voices that comes. So I love Sarah's point about be personable, tell a story, you know, just like throw that out, right? We need to invent newer, more engaging, more heartfelt models of getting this message out. And so I don't want to, I'm over time, but I like that last point about the academic hierarchy must be challenged. Because work that does not bring in $15 million grants and 10 publications per year is not currently valued on our campuses, right? And those people who are bringing in those big dollar grants and are racking up those numbers are eating up all the goodies for the rest of us. So wealth begets wealth. How do we break that cycle in, on a college campus? And last but not least, the training piece, of course, is something that we cannot overlook. But the good news is younger scientists want this training. We are actually not even able to deliver it to them right now. So how can we use these platforms or these transdisciplinary research environments that are actually delivering solutions and co-producing knowledge towards, towards these solutions as frameworks to help these people plug into a real world, in some cases, backyard problem? In Georgia, we serve a lot of in-state students. I can't tell you how impactful it is to be working on problems in Georgia, although Borneo is pretty cool. And uh, also, of course, think about those cross-disciplinary skill sets that we can nurture in them. And we can actually do that pretty easily in, in academia. If we really are mindful about it, we could see these projects across colleges a lot more easily. People want to be working on these things. Last but not least, I have the benefit of directing something called the Global Change Program at Georgia Tech, which is a newfangled thing. And it tries to build capacity for climate solutions in the education and research and public engagement capacities that we can, we can think about. And I'm hiring an associate director. So if you want to put your PhD to work in a new way, I'd love to uh, welcome you to this most sustainable building uh, in the southeastern US, uh, which provides more zero carbon energy than it consumes. It runs on its own water grid, and it has health and equity in every aspect of its design. And it is a stunningly beautiful example of what our low carbon future could look like, folks. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wow, wow, um, uh, you guys, 
can I be a little colloquial? colloquial? Holy shit. Um, <laughs> I love intelligent, brilliant people. I think I, I think I just fell in love five times this afternoon. Um, okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to give you a few minutes to interact with the panelists, um, and and uh, and then we're going to uh, try to capture you and keep you in the room. So we really want you to stay here and talk to us. I'm going to get Ed May back up here in a few minutes as well, and because he came up with the brilliant set of points that I showed you in this presentation. I wouldn't have come up with this. Ed's smarter than I am. Um, and so he will come up and just go through these so briefly and then we want to talk to you about these for a few minutes and, and round table it. So right now we're going to turn it Please go to the microphone if you want to ask a question um, and, and start racing. Go for the microphone. Hey. Is it on? Hi. Okay. So I've been trying to figure out how to phrase this as a question. But it, something that sort of worries me, and also thank you for putting together this panel because it was amazing and you all are amazing. But something that worries me is sort of a backlash to the anti-science and the anti-evidence thing that we've seen for so many years towards the other direction of the world is going to end in 10 years and mine is the only plan to get climate change done and we just have to like ram it through, which to me seems very concerning but it's because it has the potential to get into all these other, you know, systems of power and things that are not going to be executed as well as they could. And I guess I was just looking for you, your thoughts and reassurances that we only have to worry about the science deniers and not the sort of knee-jerk kind of people. I don't know, is that something that you guys think about also or? <laughs> Because we got to do it right. Like, there's there's a middle ground, but it's so hard. Who wants to handle that one? I can handle. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we don't need fascists, right? right? <laughs> you know, science is nested inside of complex systems of of political and public structure and yeah. historical systems of disenfranchisement and violence. Yeah. And hurt people, hurt people, right? Yeah. Scientists themselves are really often but not always, very wounded vessels for this information. We transact in ways that are unaccountable. Yeah. And we force people down a very narrow pathway of public agreement you know, with the central narrative that we are the ones that control the discourse. And it's, it's, it's bad behavior, right? And, and yet, you can, you can give a lot, there's a lot of, I have a lot of empathy for people struggling with what to do in this space as individuals, because none of us signed up for this kind of moment in history and in, in our careers. Like, I wanted to study invertebrates, right? That's not happening. Um, <laughs> so we, it's messy. But I think yeah. the, what you're asking is for is like, how do we get some guardrails against reductive- Going too hard. The op like, I hear, I, I hope it's just a Bay Area, like, bias because everybody thinks they can engineer their way out of a problem. But they're talking about like geoengineering and I study clouds and aerosols and I don't think that's a great idea. I don't think we know enough about that. Like that's just, that just seems like you're going all the way in the opposite direction and you're like making decisions for people and it, it seems icky and yeah. It's totally icky. Yeah, it's just a very sciencey term. It's not, it's not appropriate, and it's yeah. the manifestation of their lens of centrality yeah. and power in narrating what's happening right now. Yeah. Because ultimately, what we need on the ground is the protection and stewarding of human rights and reproductive rights. Like, we know how to take care of people, and we know that by taking care of people, that those actions in the context of thinking about the emissions that are the externalizations of harm, including emissions, like we can effectively capture and reduce those externalities. But we actually have to care about people to do that. And then the the frame of caring is a is a is a you know, it is not bad itself, but it is highly feminine coded, right? So we think about caring as like those people over there will care. But my job is to make money. And that is broken. And that's, that is per, the, the, the paradigm that we are operating in is one that is fundamentally broken because we are trying to help, but then we also eschew the norms that, would, that are required to actually act in, in caring and heartfelt ways. Yeah. Cool. 
Yeah, there's there's no answer, but thanks for. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'd just like to add just one thing to that. Yeah. I I think that there's a lot of really very rich work that's. Um, that, that is also available within academic communities and particularly with, within fields such as science and technology studies. But I will say that there's also been a lot of what, what I, I think is a, a bit of a backlash against science and technology studies from some scientists, and perhaps that's something coming out of the science wars from the 1990s. But this idea that talking about the limits of science is somehow an attack on science, which it isn't. Uh, and so, it, so I, I would like to say that we have a wealth of, of remarkable um, discussions about the very issues that you're talking about, and perhaps just opening ourselves up to to knowing where that is. So I wanted to thread in just a couple of people's voices that I think are very, very important to um, perhaps to spend some time with, and 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 that these issues are it again. How do we come into a place where we can respect the importance, um, the importance of all science? I, I just want to say uh, call out to Naomi Oreska's new book, um, Why Trust Scientists, which She's I haven't awesome. had a chance to read, um, but I think it's really, really important. And yet, I also think that that alongside this very important book, we also need to know the limits of. Of, of, of reductionism, of determinism, of statistical reasoning, when, of, of universalism, when it comes to making policy decisions. And how do we do both? Can we keep all of our eyes open? And how do we convey that to people who don't understand statistics? Because I barely understand statistics. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hi, thank, huge thanks to this amazing panel. Uh, I'm an interloper at AGU in that I'm an interdisciplinary social scientist. I work loads with natural scientists, but very much fish out of water, good phrase. Uh, for my efforts to work with natural scientists and to examine the re relationship between soil and uh, society, I was rewarded by um, a panel of a fellowship which took me three months of blood, sweat, and tears to write, telling me that my sample size was too small. Um, so that's an illustration of the challenge that you have already identified in terms of funding. But I have a, 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 just a couple of quick things to say, not to hog the floor. Uh, so yes, there are lots of us social scientists who really want to work with you. And we want to work with you not on communicating your science, but on helping you think about your research questions. So bring us in on day one, bring us in on day zero, and we will help you, and we will work with you, and we will apologize with you, <laughs> because we also are not experts of people. We just know slightly different things. So together we can do slightly different things. Um, I think that this com the comments that you have made about changing structures and recognizing that the pressure points is with the funders, is extremely important. So I can already see that within the UK, the fact that uh, there is an encouragement for uh, the funding of interdisciplinary work and um, an encouragement, uh, a facilitation of cross-funding between funding councils is having an effect. It's far from perfect, but it's a good step forward. And I think this is the direction that we should be going to. My final um, thing is finally the question to the panel. Um, coming back to Jane's original presentation, where she talked about serving society and how science can serve society. Um, I think it's extremely important, as your research shows, that society is not homogenous. And Deciding whom we are going to assist is a political question. So are we going to assist with our research big ag? Are we going to assist with our research developers? Are we going to assist with our research engineering firms? Big capital, that's one trajectory. And people will have good ethical reasons for believing that that's the right thing to do. And then there will be other people who will have good ethical reasons to believe that, no, you need to empower local communities, you need to work with the disenfranchised, you need to work with those whose voices are not included in the room. And I think it's extremely important going forward to recognize 
that as science takes politics in, it's going to have to have a science wars within sciences, and there will be many points of view, and there will not be consensus. Thank you very much for those questions. I recognize we've got two other folks with questions, and we're going to lose two of our panelists very shortly. So if you could please pose your questions quickly. We'll take both of you, and then we'll go back to the panel. Um, I, my question and, and I, uh, is, to, is why has AGU um, not yet called for a general strike? We should take this seriously, or a series of general strikes. Um, you know, if, if we really want, if, if activists don't bring disruption now, nature will bring disruption later. So if we take it seriously, we should take it seriously. Thank you. Question to the role of society, science societies. Next question, please. Yeah, uh, in Sedita, uh, my name is Kendra. I work um, with indigenous and other communities. Um, I'm an environmental chemist, and we look at the risks of mining projects. And I guess I, what I have is a plea to bring together the social scientists, the behavioral, and the hard sciences to look at the intersection of climate and mining. Um, it's a really hard intersection for me because at the very local scale, we have communities that want their landscape intact. And on the wider scale, we have these solutions that may require a lot of mining. And I have yet to see a scientific society, I've seen an NGO society bring together people, I think with a, a incredible bias coming into it and not reaching for the hard solutions. So that's, that's my plea, thank you. So um, I see people are ready to talk. I know that you two have to leave soon. So would you like, uh, Jane, would you go first and then Sarah? So go ahead, Sarah. Uh, regarding the strike, the reason why um, strikes are not called and we don't think about uh, academic workers as actual workers is because um, we are not rooted in our own histories. We don't know about the labor rights movement. We do not understand the difference between institutions and ourselves. We expect institutions to love us. Institutions cannot actually love us. That is not their function. Uh, we have no robust theory of power um, to transact and force institutions to change. So it's a massive blind spot. And uh, for any of you that know graduate students or postdocs that have unionized, um, Congratulate them. It's a massive reorganization of the shift of power inside of an institution. And it's an example for any climate organizers. It's an example of what you can do when you act collectively and in solidarity with one another. Well, first of all, again, this is a really great panel. I've learned a lot. Um, it's really good to be challenged, and I think this is a time where we need to challenge ourselves. Uh, to challenge our ways we think of the role of uh, science as an institution within a larger world. I think we've got some very provocative talks tonight that made me think a lot, which is hopefully all of us were challenged today. Um, but also, can we get out of the bloody ivory tower a little bit more, please? Because like, I, I hear, like, oh, we natural scientists need to go down the hall and talk to the social scientists. Like, we both need to get out of the bloody ivory tower and go talk to the real world. That's what we really need to do. And again, that, you know, the two ears, one mouth kind of thing. Um, I spent a lot more time talking to people like in business and in communities and things like this and others of, on this panel do even more. Uh, I think that I would really encourage us to get out of the ivory tower kind of thinking that somehow the solutions to our problems are found within. They're not. They absolutely are not. They're never going to be. And so I think and Kim's project is a good example of this. We're going to learn a lot more from engaging communities than we'll ever believe. And also the focus on things like funding and institutional awards, that's wonderful. Somebody who's left academia altogether and very happy for it, I encourage you to do the same. Giving up tenure was the easiest thing I've ever done. Because all it did was say, oh, gee, you won't be fired for doing something you didn't really like doing anymore. 
you know, like, fine, I'll quit. <laughs> you know, it was fine, you know. I loved universities, but, you know, you, there are lots of other places you can be effective with a PhD, well, I hope. Um, so go, you know, go out and be a little brave, because I think we have great role models here who are braver than any of us who've really charted incredible paths, uh, think like Jane herself and others who've, you know, really stretched beyond the ivory tower, and I think that's where our biggest uh, successes are going to be when we leave the ivory tower, both in terms of listening, but also stepping out of it in terms of our potential roles. I mean, I think I think there's still a role for for academia to play. In. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. So I'm going to keep my tenure job, but um, uh, but I, I know. It's, <laughs> well, okay. How much? No, just kidding. Um, so I think I think really what 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 it feels like to me now is that um, you know higher education institutions are are such an engine for capacity building. Um, honestly, they are, they are conduits for engaging and in training the broader public in the, the you know, manufacture and consolidation of knowledge and advances and innovation um, in community building. Across many states, we have these incredible, robust public institutions um, that are served by taxpayer money, right? And so we, we actually owe it back to the science contract, part of our science contract, is to leverage that network and leverage that capacity for public good. Hopefully we can bring a more laser focus to that in an era of accelerating climate change. So I think I view, I view my role and I hope that those of you who sit in academic positions or aspire to sit there, first that you see a role for yourselves and know that those of us who are there are throwing some elbows and trying to make some extra space for what it might look like to be an academic working in this field in the 21st century. We need you. Thank you. So uh, I, I'm going to continue on the thread of, of actually uh, supporting both of these claims that, that I think we absolutely need the, the academic conversations and, and to, to move beyond some of the discussions that we're having to bring in a, a, a broader diversity of voices. And I think that we're in a moment right now where we, climate change is really at, forcing us to ask a lot of questions about the proper role of science in society. And, and, and again, that the, the, the very important discussions that we've had about the social contract have, have, have given us a lens for that. And, and I think that it, it does get us to think not only about about uh, scientific uh, knowledge, but also about the values. And the, and the values of science are very important. But I think we can never forget that even, although science and democracy in many ways grew up together, uh, that the values of science, if they're not tethered to the values of democracy, might lead us down some very problematic roads. They have before. So if we can put science not only in society but in democracy and make those democratic values of not only creating knowledge for society but also about ensuring that we have equity, ensuring that we have opportunities for different voices, and ensuring that we have opportunities to share our different perspectives and to listen respectfully and with humility, I think that we can go a really long way in charting a much more um, uh, satisfying, sustainable, equitable, and, and hopefully um, profitable, but by that I mean enriching ourselves beyond just monetary value. So, thank you. So it's been just a real treat to listen to all these fabulous presentations. Uh, a lot of really deep uh, insights here and a wealth of experience. So thank you all so much uh, for sharing your thoughts. Um, and thanks very much to the organizers. Uh, you guys did a terrific job. Uh, and I know that each of you probably wanted to ha say a lot on this topic, and yet you gave up your uh, opportunity to let us hear from others. So I really appreciate that. Um, a few thoughts have uh, come into my mind as all of the speakers were um, speaking. Um, <clears throat> one of them is uh, that uh, the, we all uh, are, are focused on sort of the role of science uh, in society. And I think it's worth keeping in mind that a uh, poll that was done a number of years ago, not that long ago, maybe four or five years ago, uh, <clears throat> that asked Americans, uh, but I suspect this is true globally, um, to name a living scientist. And <clears throat> the finding of this poll 
that has been uh, touted by Research America was that uh, more than half of the American population, uh, actually 70% of the American population, could not name a living scientist. And I think that just brings home how out of touch we often are. And as we're thinking about um, participatory research and participatory uh, engagement with society, um, part of what we are doing is uh, reconnecting with society because those, those people don't see scientists as, you know, they don't know scientists and people, so I just, I just think that's worth keeping in mind here. Um, we also have had this construct in science, this mindset in science, that if we understand something well enough, we can predict it. And that's sort of the fallacy of reductionism, that, that we can predict something. And much of our funding system has come about with scientists pitching uh, that, give me enough money and I can understand it, then I'll give you the answers. And in fact, that's not the world that we live in at all. And it's definitely not the world with all the environmental changes and social changes that are underway. Uh, we have to have a different mindset about our expectations for science. It's not gonna have you know, the answers, which is what people have been saying over and over and over. Uh, but it's not just there are limitations to science and to knowledge. It's also that we have changed systems in such fundamental ways that the past is no longer, the future is not going to be what the past was. And so there are additional complications to the limits of knowledge that I think are worth keeping in mind here. Um, so we need to think about managing human activities in a different way. We have to expect surprises. We have to plan with the expectation that there are going to be floods where you didn't expect floods to be, and a heck of a lot more. So that's a different way of thinking about the world, and we do need to be intellectually honest as well as sort of change our pitches to society about give us money so we can give you the answers, because that's just not really the way uh, it should work. Um, finally, I, th I think this has been just a, a rich discussion about knowledge, respect, equity, uh, participation, uh, and humility. And I think it's given a lot of food for thought, and I think the discussions about where do we go from here, how do we build on these thoughts and actually create n not just talk, but create opportunities for action will be a very rich opportunity. So. Uh, that's, uh, I guess, an invitation for everybody to continue thinking about this and wrestling with it uh, because it's really important. And we need all of us working on it and a lot more people that aren't in this room. So thank you all very much and let's continue the dialogue. Thanks. Thank, thanks to all our panelists. Now, thank you. I know that a lot of you are probably a little bit worried about time. You know, we have asked for a little bit more of your time today. Don't be too worried. We have the room until 7.30 in the morning, so it's okay, you know? So if those of you who are willing to talk to us, please come on up. We, we want to get down dirty on the floor and talk to you now, and we want to talk about this environmental research letters publications. You know, we need your help. We, just, we, you know, we need all of you, and we need to bring in more. So uh, please come on up here. Ed's going to talk about these points. Oops. Where is Ed? Where is Ed? He's going to talk about these points in just a minute, uh, okay, but I'm going to let these panel the panelists get off the stage because they've all got to go places too. Thank you so much, everybody. Come on up here, please. <laughs>